You might have noticed there was no scripture reading included in the bulletin, just three question marks. I thought if we announced the most assaulted text and then told everybody what it was, where was the mystery? So this way you had a chance to think about what is the most assaulted text in the Bible. Uh, as many of you know, I've been trying to get rid of a cough for a long time and <clears throat> did not succeed today. It's been constant almost. And, uh, but I have some water here and some cough drops and uh, two people to volunteer to take my place. Connor said he would be glad to and uh, so he volunteered himself and Marina volunteered Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is his subject matter that he spends a lot of time on. Uh, atheists and modernists alike attack Genesis chapter 1, verse, uh, verses, chapters 1 through 11. They attack it as not being literally true. Modernists began doing this back in the 17-1800s, and then with the rise of uh, evolution in the 1800s, uh, there were even more who tried to cast doubt on Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, from an easily obtained internet document, there is one with a title called New Atheists on Genesis 1 through 11 and 19. And here are some of the things that you can find. Here are some of the reading materials you can find. The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. He said, gods are fragile things. They may be killed by um, uh, science or common sense. Uh, yeah, gods, but not the God that we have just read about in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. Breaking the Spell is another book uh, that uh, has been uh, popular by Daniel Dennett. And uh, he thinks that uh, there's just uh, no, that if you're fair-minded, you should admit that the Bible is no good and evolution is true. Uh, and I think, you know, probably everybody who reads this statement is probably saying, yeah, that's fair. Uh, no, not really. Then uh, The End of Faith by Sam Harris. If I could write a, or wave a magic wand and get rid of either rape or religion, I would choose, I would not hesitate to get rid of religion. I wonder what his wife thinks. And then uh, another one, God is Not Great, by Christopher Hitchens. If religious instruction were not allowed until the child attained the age of reason, we would have quite a different world. Yes, and we're seeing daily what that world is becoming like. And it's not a pretty sight. But these are some of those who have attacked the Bible, denounced the Bible as dangerous, uh, suppressive to scientific inquiry, and as inculcating and promoting problematical, contemptible, even abhorrent moral values. The Genesis 1 through 11 and 19 creation, Noah, and Lot narratives persists among the new atheists' favorite targets. Now, if you haven't figured out why Genesis 19 is included in this now, it just used to be Genesis 1 through 11. But now they've added Genesis 19 to it, and if you haven't figured that out, we'll get to that in just a few moments. But this is the reason why we want to examine some of the teachings that are in these uh, chapters. They are not accidental. They are not incidental. They are not isolated. The things taught in Genesis 1 through 11 and, and 19 are found consistently throughout the Old and New Testament. These are not one-time obscure teachings like 
you sometimes find in Proverbs where you're not quite sure uh, what was meant and the Hebrew is a little obscure. No, these are stated facts. They're not ambiguous in any way and they are reiterated constantly throughout the Bible. So we go to Genesis chapter 1 and uh, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, who could possibly find fault with that? Well, how about atheists and evolutionists? They can't even get past the very first verse of the scriptures. And yet, the entire Bible, as we've indicated, uh, teaches this same thing. Let's turn to Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9. Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Complete harmony between that and Genesis chapter 1. An instantaneous universe undermines everything about uh, upward evolution. In uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, notice what Paul said, in, among other things, in his famous uh, sermon on Mars Hill. Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Research the history of evolution and you will find a tremendous amount of racism in the teachings and in the applications. But if you read the Bible, you read that God made all nations. And these are considered dangerous moral principles. But there is uh, plenty more that the Bible teaches. We did not evolve. God made everything and he made it through Jesus. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 1, the very first three verses. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time fast unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, which he had uh, by himself purged our sins, sat down at the hand, uh, right hand of the majesty on high. And so there is what uh, the Bible teaches in just a smattering of passages on creation. Oh, but uh, there are ways for science and the Bible to get along, aren't there? Well, some think so. In fact, each year on the Sunday closest to Darwin's birthday, Pastors from, the, uh, from around the world celebrate Evolution Sunday. Can you believe that anybody would celebrate such a day that claims to be a Christian? And uh, we are talking about the obvious limited evolution versus the upward evolution. One in, has never been proven, the other is an obvious fact. But the great leaps and the missing links... Well, they're still leaping and they're still missing. They haven't uh, been found yet. But many celebrate, churches celebrate Evolution Sunday. They speak from the pulpit about Darwin's contribution to our understanding of the world. 
Really? That must be a challenge. Darwin Day is celebrated around the world on February 12th. Does that day sound familiar? Well, yes, it does. That's Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Both men were born on that day, February 12th, and in the same year. Not just the same day, but the same year as well, 1809. Lincoln freed people. Darwin's theory allowed them to become slaves to their own lusts. Because without God, objective morality cannot exist. Now, we've dealt with that subject before and probably will again, but we just note that this evening because there's so many other things that we need to give attention to. The next thing we want to notice is that the Bible teaches literal 24-hour days of creation. Look at Genesis 1:5, 8, 13, 19, 23, 31, and chapter 2, 1 through 3, and you will find that each one records an evening and a morning and a specific day is designated in each one of those. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Consider the corroboration in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, when God gave the Ten Commandments and required the Sabbath day to keep it holy, he said, for in six days he had created the earth. Not six eons, not six epochs, six days he created the earth and rested on the seventh day. But also take a look at Exodus chapter <clears throat> 31 and beginning with verse 12. Exodus 31, beginning with verse 12. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between you and me throughout your generations, <clears throat> that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you, Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be uh, cut off from among his people. Notice two things. One, this was between God and his people Israel, not God and all nations. And second, the penalty for violating this was death. I don't know anybody advocating that today that claims we ought to worship on the Sabbath. If you're going to take part of this, you have to take it all, as Paul points out in Galatians 5, 1 through 4. At any rate, verse 15, <clears throat> work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath. <coughs> <coughs> the Sabbath of rest now it's holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. This is what we mean by these facts being repeated frequently in the, the, throughout the Bible. Now, the Jews still kept the Sabbath at the time of Christ. The Bible is consistent from Moses to John. And I said Moses because he wrote the first five books of the Bible and John wrote the book of Revelation. So from Genesis to Revelation or from Moses to John, the Bible is consistent. God did not write Genesis chapter one necessarily 
to refute evolution, although it does, and so do all these other passages. He wrote it to record the truth. No matter where man's wisdom, quote unquote, might lead him in the future. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 recorded that man was made from the dust of the ground. After he sinned, his body would eventually return to the dust. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7, the body returns to the dust from which it came and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Also, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, uh, 47 uh, verifies these particular points. The New Testament also corroborates the Old Testament. They are uh, in harmony with one another. Now let's go on to another reason why Genesis 1 through 11 is one of the most assaulted and 19 passages in the Bible. And the next category is, uh, or reason is that of marriage. Many do not like the definition of marriage presented in Genesis 2, 18 through 24. And again, none of these are isolated. Jesus cited this very passage in Matthew 19, 3 through 9. Homosexuals don't like the passage. Polygamists don't like the passage. They would like in fact, uh, even though Jesus taught one man and one woman, going back to this verse, you have a major world religion disregarding that, the Muslims, in order to practice polygamy. They want to practice polygamy. They would prefer that this text were not in the Bible. They would like for Genesis 2, 18 through 24, to be a myth. But, of course, it is not a myth, it is a fact. You could uh, like the fact that Mount St. Helens was about to erupt, or you could not like it. I suspect most people didn't like it. Or you could believe it, or not believe it. But guess what? It still erupted. And the same thing is true with the judgment. You can like the idea or not like it. You can believe it or you can not believe it. You can believe the Bible or not believe the Bible, but there will be a day of judgment whether you believe it or like it or not. It, the truth doesn't matter on how man views it. The truth is the truth. And it will occur as God has said that it will when we get to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we have a view of man having free will. Nobody likes the concept of sin. Many people, New Age religions, do away, or try to, with the concept of sin because this causes human beings to have to be responsible. People seem to uh, like to blame someone else for their mistakes. They will like to say, well, I was born this way, or it's my environment. That's what's making me do this. Some people even say Satan is making them do things. No, we are responsible for the decisions that we make. God told Cain he had free will and he was responsible. Notice <clears throat> what God said to him in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. We have free will. We have freedom of choice. We oftentimes exercise it wrongly, but we have it. 
In these temptations in Genesis chapter 3, those same types of temptation, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life still persist to this day. Satan tempted Jesus with the same appeals in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and of course they're mentioned in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And we are still responsible for what we choose to do. Now let's take a look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. <clears throat> This is part of the penalty that God gave to Adam and Eve and the serpent. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, some think the proof here is weak, but God addresses the serpent. He does not tell the terp, uh, serpent, I will put enmity between you and the man or between you and mankind. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. There is only one woman who ever had a seed without the help of a man, and that is Mary. Jesus was born of a woman. Born under the law, Galatians 3, 16. The seed is Christ, and he was God's son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, some think, and you've probably heard this if you've taken some college courses or something, that since various pagan religions have virgin birth stories, that Matthew and Luke probably copied those ideas from pagan ideas. And yet we know that Satan tries to copy the true. He presents himself as an angel in heaven. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen 13 through 15. How long had Satan understood about the virgin birth? How about since the Garden of Eden? Naturally, he copied virgin birth stories before it actually occurred because he knew it was going to occur. He could understand enmity between seed, the seed of uh, your seed and her seed. And uh, so naturally, he encouraged pagan religions to invent those stories to try to discredit the scriptures. But the scriptures still stand. Next, we want to deal with another reason why people do not like Genesis 1 through 11, and that is because of Genesis 3, 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow in your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Today, in the world, feminists, at least, despise the idea of male leadership. They would undoubtedly vote this verse out of the Bible, along with those that refer to it. And again, the Bible is consistent. Notice all of the verses, 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 11.3, the head of every woman is man, the head of every man is Christ. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, teaching subjection. The passage in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, uh, emphasizing that uh, male spiritual leadership is what God requires. The obedience of wives to their husbands also in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. There are all of these passages and feminists despise them all and do not want to recognize that it is part of the penalty for sin. Now there are some other things that are taught in Genesis 1 through 11. The origin of music and industry. Let's take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 21. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who played the harp and uh, the flute. Uh, 
Jabal, the first one, was the father of those who dealt, uh, dwelt in tents and had livestock. And uh, also, we find industry in that same text, Genesis 4, uh, 22, and so forth. Many theorize that human speech did not begin for millions of years after man evolved, and yet God created man to speak. I don't know how long people think, uh, and I've had linguistics, I can't remember how long. Some believe that it was possible that it took for languages to evolve. It took just a few seconds in Genesis chapter 11. God created the different languages. They didn't evolve over thousands or millions of years. They were created instantaneously so that man could not understand one another. And uh, men figured out about bronze and iron long before uh, they're credited with doing so. Uh, somebody probably invented the Bronze Age over dinner one night. <laughs> but uh, they, they quite early on figured out some things along those lines and were able to create products. We have some precise genealogies in Genesis chapter 5. One can learn from that the time of the creation to the time of the flood, it was precisely 1,656 years from the creation. Evolutionists need millions of years. Creationists don't need anything. We just rely on the way God described it to us. Again, Genesis 10 and 11 gives us the origin of languages and countries. The many languages did not take all those years to develop as we've been taught, but happened instantaneously. And then we come to the flood. The enemies of God reject the flood as a myth because in order for the millions of years evolutionists need for the theory to work, on, uh, depends on the doctrine of uniformitarianism. The same processes going on at the same rate for centuries. The flood disrupts that idea. And so they don't like the flood. Uh, they, uh, they call it uh, flood theology and other names that they like to make up. They do a lot of things except refute it. Everything that has happened in this world makes sense because of the flood. Uh, you take that away, you're going to have to have millions of years. But the truth is recorded in the scriptures. Afterward, God authorized the eating of animals. This was a change in the world's uh, practice. He also taught respect for human life by instituting capital punishment as described in Genesis 9, 5, and 6. Most liberals oppose that. Another change occurring after the flood was God placing the rainbow in the sky. This symbol has nothing to do with people's sexual preferences. God gave this sign to the whole world for a specific purpose, and Christians should not be prepared to give it up. We had this sign first. God gave this sign first, and it should be respected in the sense that he gave it to mankind. Then we have the flood and the New Testament. 1 Peter 3, 21 uh, shows that uh, we have uh, an anti-type uh, to the flood, namely baptism, which causes uh, our sins to be forgiven. God cleansed the earth with a flood, but it turned wicked again. After the fire, only righteousness dwells with God. Now let's come to Genesis 19. Why has this been added to the hate list of Genesis 1 through 11? While modernists and liberals once picked on just the first 11 chapters, now they insist on including this one. Why? Because God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for the sins 
of homosexuality. There is no question concerning that if you just take a look at Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. <clears throat> Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. Notice how pervasive this was. Notice how thorough this was. Every social stratus, uh, stratus every age, they were all involved in the sin. They all wanted to participate in the sin. And they called the lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we may know them carnally. The town was thoroughly perverted. So these are some of the reasons that these texts are under assault. And yet, you have to throw out the entire Bible because these ideas, these precepts, these teachings are not just found in Genesis 1 through 11 and, ver and uh, chapter 19. Jesus quotes from these things. They form uh, a lot of the basis for what's taught in the New Testament. And so if you throw out Genesis 1 through 11, just pitch the rest of it with it. They stand or fall together. They stand. They don't fall. Evolution will fall. It will be obvious to everyone on the day of judgment. All of the wickedness that is described will be obvious to all on the day of judgment, but we need to know that now, and other people need to know that now. So, what are some of the reasons for rejection? They did not like God as creator. They did not like man having to be responsible for his actions. Evolution serves as an excuse for immoral behavior. Man then becomes responsible for his marital decisions. Man becomes responsible for his moral decisions as well. Man is accountable to God ultimately. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Just as people were accountable in the day of Noah, so people will be accountable before the judgment seat of Christ. Now that flood, as we said, is an, uh, there's an antitype to it, namely baptism. We are saved through water, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And uh, we need to make a note of that. As they were judged by water, well, are we going to be one of the few, one of the eight souls that was saved? Are we going to be like those? Are we ready for the day of judgment? Or, as we're about to sing, be prepared to meet your God. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Well, then... If you've repented of your sins, you need to be baptized. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then once you are uh, in the body of Christ and your sins are washed away, then you must remain faithful throughout your days. Can we help you remain faithful or can we help you enter into the body of Christ after your sins are forgiven? by being baptized for the forgiveness of them. Let us know while we stand and while we sing.